Welcome to SKB, Dissecting the Serial Killer's Brain. I'm your host, Caroline, a university biology professor and true crime junkie. Thanks for joining me on my quest to understand evil. I've often wondered why I haven't had uh, more more dreams or, or nightmares about what I've done. For some reason, it's like it's it's blocked off from part of my mind. If I dwelled on the subject all the time, I would uh, I wouldn't be able to function. If you are sensitive to descriptions of paraphilic activities and murder, well, buckle in because Dahmer did a lot of disturbing things. I could go into a lot more detail about the background of the victims and the actual murders themselves, but the driving force behind SKB is to understand the psychological and physiological factors that create monsters like Jeffrey Dahmer. We left Jeffrey Dahmer in 1985, 1986. Well, his alcohol use continued to increase, and he began to hang out at gay bars since he had been banned from the bathhouses. On nights that he would go out to the to the gay bars in Milwaukee, he would often rent a room at the Ambassador Hotel, and he'd bring men back to the room and then drug them. A number of men came forward after Dahmer's arrest in 1991 to testify to having been with him at the bathhouse or after meeting him at a bar. There were something like 10 or 11 of these men. One man, William Blair, was one of the lucky ones. He and Dahmer had met at a bathhouse and engaged in consensual sex a few times. One summer night in 1986, Dahmer and Blair ran into each other, and Dahmer invited him back to the ambassador. Blair got his own room, but he went back to Dahmer's room with him first. Blair woke up the next morning. He was naked, and he was in his own room, but he had no memory of the night before. So after this, Dahmer's use of pornography continued to increase and his fantasies grew darker and darker. The activities of going to bars and drugging men placated him for a while, but then sometime in either early September or November of 1987, um, published dates for this one are kind of all over the place, Dahmer met Stephen Toomey. The two men went to Dahmer's room at the Ambassador Hotel where Dahmer drugged him. They engaged in consensual sexual activity before the sleeping pills knocked Toomey out. Dahmer eventually fell asleep. Uh, And when he woke up the next morning, he was on top of Toomey, who apparently he had beaten him to death. When I moved to Milwaukee in 81, uh, I started reading pornography, going to the bookstores. Um, eventually that led to uh, frequenting the gay bars and then I one time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room the ambassador hotel uh, was just planning on drugging him and uh, spending the night with him I had no intention of hurting him when I woke up in the morning he uh, had a broken rib here was heavily bruised Apparently, I had uh, beaten him to death with my fists. And you have no memory? I have no memory of it. But that's what started the whole spree all over again. Dahmer claimed to have no recollection of the event. But panicked, he paid for another night at the hotel, and then he went down to Woolworths, and he purchased a large suitcase, one big enough to fit Toomey's body into. And then he caught a cab back to his grandmother's house, his victim's body in tow. Dahmer kept Toomey's body for a week, um, all the while he was having sex with it before he finally had to dispose of it by dismemberment. Dahmer disposed of everything except for the victim's head and genitals. He kept those to have as a masturbatory stimulant. He cleaned the flesh off of Toomey's severed head by placing it in Soilex. And Soilex is a detergent. It's an alkaline substance that's used to remove things like grease and oil. And just in case you're unfamiliar with how acids and bases work, The terms acidic and alkaline, they refer to pH or potential hydrogen. 
If a substance is acidic, it has a pH below 7, so lots of hydrogen ions. If it's alkaline, it has a pH above 7, so few hydrogen ions. So to put it in perspective, your blood has a pH of about 7.4. Your stomach acids have a pH somewhere between 1 and 3. This is why dentists are often the first to be able to... Um, to diagnose an eating disorder because the enamel of the teeth gets uh, gets eaten away by the stomach acids. So if you spill something like sulfuric acid on your skin, it'll cause immediate severe burns because it reacts with the moisture in your skin. Well, something like hydrofluoric acid has a delayed reaction on the skin, eventually it causes deep, painful burns. If you spill an alkaline substance such as soylex or borax on your skin, it reacts with the oils um, and it causes the formation of a soapy film, and this then corrodes the skin. So over time, the Soilex will totally destroy any soft tissue. So that's what he was doing. After murdering Stephen Toomey, Dahmer gives in to his compulsive urges and begins to actively hunt for victims. On January 16th or 17th, 1988, Dahmer met James Doxeter, a 14-year-old Native American sex worker. Dahmer lured Doxeter to his grandmother's house because Dahmer was still living with his grandmother, with the promise of $50 to pose for nude photos. He drugged James, then strangled him, keeping the boy's corpse for a week, using it for sexual stimulation and masturbating on it frequently. Eventually, he dismembered and dis disposed of the boy's body, but kept the skull for a while. Dahmer was still on probation from the incident where he exposed himself to the two 12-year-old boys at the river. On March 24th, 1988, he was just four days out of being released from probation for that incident. Dahmer met a 22-year-old bisexual man named Richard Guerrero um, outside of a gay bar. He offered Guerrero $50 and a night of sex. Instead, Dahmer sedated him, strangled him with a leather strap. Dahmer was immediately aroused, and he performed oral sex on the corpse. 24 hours later, Dahmer dismembered the man's corpse, and he kept the skull for a while. After this, Dahmer's grandmother found a sticky black residue in the cellar, but Dahmer assured her it was just from some animal experiments he was conducting. On April 23rd, 1988, Dahmer invited a man named Ronald Flowers um, back to his grandmother's house for coffee. He met Ronald in one, of the, in one of the gay bars that he would frequent. Dahmer had laced Ronald's coffee, but then his grandmother called down to him, guessing that he wasn't alone. Because of this, Ronald Flowers was lucky, and he escaped Dahmer. Uh, Flowers quickly lost consciousness, but because Dahmer's grandmother knew he wasn't alone, instead of killing him, Dahmer dropped Flowers off at the hospital, and then he returned home to his grandmother's. Flowers reported Dahmer to the police, stating that he had been drugged and robbed, but nothing came of it. There were no more murders at grandmother's, although he did continue to bring, to bring men back to his grandmother's house. His grandmother tired of Dahmer's late-night visitors and foul smells coming from her basement, so she and Lionel requested that Dahmer move out in September of 1988. Dahmer gets his own place, and he moves in on September 25th, 1988. Less than a day later, Dahmer met 13-year-old Laotian immigrant Somsak Synthesomphom. Dahmer drugged the child, sexually assaulted him, but he let him leave. The boy got home and he passed out from the drugs. When his father couldn't wake him up, the, his parents took him to the hospital. Dahmer was quickly arrested and charged with second-degree sexual assault and enticing a child for immoral purposes. He was released on bail. Lionel hired an attorney named Gerald Boyle to defend his son, and Boyle sent Dahmer for a psychological evaluation. For some reason, Dahmer was pretty candid with his first psychologist, Dr. Lodi, telling him that he was feeling, quote, significant psychological distress, end quote, and that he was, quote, anxious, tense, and depressed, and that he harbored deep feelings of alienation. Dr. Lodi felt that Dahmer needed long-term treatment. Dahmer was then sent to a second psychologist, Dr. Goldfarb, with whom he was much more reserved. In fact, Dr. Goldfarb described him as, quote, resistant and evasive, showing irritation, anger, agitation, and answering in monosyllables and suspicious of the motives of others, end quote. 
Goldfarb felt that Dahmer showed characteristics of a schizoid personality, which according to Psychology Today is a pattern of indifference to social relationships with a limited range of emotional expression and experience. The disorder manifests itself by early adulthood through social and emotional detachments that prevent people from having close relationships. He thought that Dahmer was impulsive, unlikely to delay gratification. He was manipulative and self-centered. He felt that Jeffrey Dahmer was a seriously disturbed young man with a mixed personality disorder. The pressure he perceives seems to be increasing, and he must be considered impulsive and dangerous. On January 30th, 1989, Dahmer appeared in court to face charges for his sexual assault on some sax and sathomophone. Dahmer pled no contest, claiming that he didn't mean to drug the child. He was found guilty, but he wouldn't be sentenced until May of 1989. In the months between Dahmer's sexual assault of Sumzak and his sentencing, he committed his fifth murder. On March 25th or 29th, depending on the source, 1989, he met 26-year-old biracial Anthony Sears, who Dahmer found exceptionally attractive. He took Sears to his grandmother's house in West Allis, um, not his own apartment. I don't know why. Once the men arrived, they engaged in an oral sex, and then Dahmer drugged and strangled him. Once Sears was dead, Dahmer dismembered him and disposed of almost all of him the next day. He kept the victim's skull and genitals in acetone um, and stored the remains in his work locker. When Dahmer was arrested in 1991, he still had Sears' skull in his apartment. When he was finally sentenced for his sexual assault against the 13-year-old boy, Dahmer was given five years for second-degree sexual assault and three years for enticing a child for immoral purposes. The charges were reduced to one year at the House of Corrections and five years probation, and he was ordered to register as a sex offender. The district attorney wanted five years, but Gerald Boyle, Dahmer's lawyer, argued that Dahmer had a job um, and that this is a one-time thing. And Dahmer really gave an amazing performance, blaming the alcohol. Dahmer was allowed work release. And while he was incarcerated, Lionel wrote a letter to the judge that stated, quote, I have tremendous reservations regarding Jeff's chances when he heads to streets. He concluded his request um, saying that Jeffrey should not be told that he was written, presumably because he didn't want him to, um, to, he didn't want Jeffrey to realize that, that Lionel was urging that Jeffrey be given more psychotherapy. He wrote to the judge, I sincerely hope that you might intervene in some way to help my son, whom I love very much and for whom I want a better life. This may be, he said, our last chance. While in jail, Dahmer's behavior earned him a 12-hour furlough on Thanksgiving in 1989. But instead of going home to spend time with his family, Dahmer went to a bar to get drunk and find a victim. Well, instead of finding a victim, Dahmer met a man whose apartment he went to. And Dahmer blacked out. When he woke up, he was hogtied and suspended from the ceiling um, as the man was sodomizing him with a candlestick. Oh, poor baby, huh? Because of his stellar behavior while in jail, Dahmer was released to probation two months early. This was despite his father's protest um, for Lionel really wanted Jeffrey to seek psychiatric help. When Dahmer's probation ended on March 2nd, 1990, he moved back in with his grandmother until he could find his own place. It was a couple of weeks later on May 14th, 1990, that Jeffrey Dahmer moved into the now infamous Oxford Apartments, number 213 at 924 North 25th Street. Just two weeks after he moved in, and the published dates kind of vary, Dahmer met 32-year-old Ricky Beats, um, also known as Raymond Smith or Cash D. Using his typical line, he invited Ricky back to his apartment to pose for photos. Dahmer drugged and strangled Beeks, and once he was dead, Dahmer then engaged in necrophilia. He dismembered the man's body, and he kept the skull. Uh, He painted it so that he could later use it in this altar that he had envisioned. In between his murder of Ricky Beeks and his next victim, Dahmer made a mistake. He had invited a man back to his apartment with the intention of drugging him, but instead, Dahmer drank the latest coffee, and he woke up the next morning having lost about $300 in some clothes. It's funny when bad things happen to Dahmer. A month later, on June 14, 1990, Dahmer met 28-year-old Eddie Smith. Once again, Dahmer used the old pose for picture scheme, and once he had the man back at his place, Dahmer drugged him, and then he strangled him. As was his M.O., Dahmer engaged in necrophilia. 
Um, and finally, he dismembered his victim. He attempted to keep Smith's skull, but he accidentally destroyed it in the oven. And it was this killing that started Dahmer on an even more disturbing path when he took photos of Smith in various stages of dismemberment. It was my way of remembering uh, their appearance, their physical beauty. Uh, I also wanted to keep something. If I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. And uh, I even went so far as planning on uh, setting up an altar with uh, the uh, 10 different uh, skulls and skeletons. According to Brian Master in his book, The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer, in the weeks just after the murder of Eddie Smith, Dahmer had a meeting with his probation officer, a group therapy session at DePaul, and a meeting with his counselor. He spent Saturday at the Unicom Club in Chicago, and the following Friday, which was his next available time off work, he met Louis Pinay, a 15-year-old. Louis went home with Dahmer on July 6th um, after Dahmer offered him $200 for sex. The two engaged in sexual activity and then fell asleep together. The next morning, they made plans to meet up again that day. Dahmer planned to kill the little boy when they met at noon, but Lewis didn't show up, or at least that's what Dahmer thought. Out at the gay bars that night, Dahmer and Lewis ran into each other, and Lewis ensured Jeffrey it was a mistake. The two went off together, and as Lewis was posing for Dahmer lying on his belly, Dahmer hit him in the back of the neck. After a bit of a struggle, Lewis left only to return a few minutes later asking for bus money. Finally, Dahmer just gave the child some money and let him go. Louis Pinay made a complaint to the police, but they didn't believe him. Just when you think Jeffrey cannot become more evil, his depravity escalates to new, even more disgusting levels. On September 3rd, 1990, Dahmer met 22-year-old dancer Ernest Miller in front of a bookstore. Miller agreed to go home with Dahmer for sex in exchange for money. But after the two had sex, Dahmer mixed up his cocktail of pills, and he realized that he did not have enough, so instead... Dahmer decided to improvise, and instead of drugging him, he slit Miller's throat, um, severing the carotid artery, which I don't know how there weren't signs of this all over Dahmer's apartment because the carotid artery is under super, super high pressure and would just go shooting out like a, a hose whose pressure is just being released. Well, once he killed Miller, Dahmer engaged in necrophilia. He took pictures of Miller's dead body, and then he dismembered him in the bathtub. And he was excited to add some new pieces to his dark altar. So Dahmer kept Miller's entire skeleton, painting the skull. Dahmer cut out Miller's heart. He dissected the man's biceps, and he kept part of, the, of Miller's legs in a freezer for later consumption. Let's listen to Dahmer describe how the cannibalism began. I was uh, branching out. That's when the cannibalism started, eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. It was a way of uh, making me feel that uh, they were a part of me. At, at, for, at first, it was just curiosity, and then it became compulsive. As you might expect, the smell coming from apartment 213 was causing neighbors to complain. The building manager investigated the smell on several occasions, but each time Dahmer had a different excuse. One, his fish had died, and he hadn't cleaned out the tank. Another, he had spoiled meat in an unplugged freezer. Jeffrey Dahmer's neighbor, Pam Bass, would later describe what it was like. Ooh, I can't even describe it. It's a horrible smell. That of me and Jeff, it went up and down the hallway smelling, you know, trying to see where it was coming from. The landlord eventually tracks the smell to Dahmer's apartment. He told the manager, well, my fish died. Then he told him my meat spoiled. And then the third time the manager came up and told him he complained about the smell. He told him you're going to be evicted next month. But I went in and helped him clean up the meat. He told me, he said, it's the freezer over there that my grandma had sent me some meat. And I put it in there and I went back to her house and I forgot to plug it in. I haven't been around no dead people. I don't know anything about how they smell. He had a very good disguise. 
That's what it was. On September 24, 1990, Dahmer met 23-year-old David Thomas at the Grand Avenue Mall um, after he'd been drinking beer all day. His murderous impulses overcame him once again, and he lured Thomas back to his apartment to pose for nude photographs for money. Thomas had a young child and was having trouble supporting that child through conventional means, so he agreed. After drugging Thomas, Dahmer realized he wasn't as attracted to him as he thought, and he considered letting him go. But instead, he strangled Thomas, fil- filming the dismemberment, and then posed Thomas's head in different places around his apartment. After this, Dahmer enters his last cooling-off period. A cooling-off period is defined as a break between killings where the murderer blends back into their normal life, reliving the murder in their imagination until the compulsion arises again. These cooling-off periods can last weeks, months, or even years. The cycle is a compulsive, obsessive, and addictive one. February 17, 1991, Dahmer met Curtis Strotter, who was 18 years old. He was an aspiring model. They met at a bus stop on Dahmer Street. Per his usual MO, Dahmer offered Strotter money to pose for, to pose for nude photographs. Dahmer drugged the young man, handcuffed him, and then strangled him while he was performing oral sex on this monster. Dahmer kept Strotter's head in the fridge and kept his hands and penis. His next victim, 19-year-old Errol Lindsay, went back to Dahmer's apartment with him for drinks on April 7th, 1991. Lindsay was the first of Dahmer's attempts to create a a zombie. So Dahmer drugged Lindsay, and then he drilled holes in the young man's head through which he injected um, muriatic acid, which is a less pure form of hydrochloric acid. But let's let that monster describe it himself. I tried to... uh keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state um, by uh, injecting um, first uh, dilute acid solution into their brain or uh, hot water and uh, it never did completely work The injection of the acid seemed to counteract the sleeping pills, and Lindsay awoke, complaining of a headache. In response, Dahmer then strangled and dismembered Lindsay using acid to destroy the victim's body. But he kept Lindsay's head. In May of 1991, Dahmer took two victims. First was 31-year-old deaf-mute Tony Hughes on on May 24th. Dahmer offered Tony money to pose nude for photos, but once back at his apartment, Dahmer drugged him, strangled him, and then dismembered Hughes. Two days later, on May 26th, Dahmer met Conorak Synthasophone, um, who was age 14, and he was the younger brother of Somsak, who Dahmer had assaulted in 1988. Conorak didn't recognize Dahmer as the man who had assaulted his brother three years ago, so Dahmer was able to lure the boy back to his apartment under the guise of posing nude for photos in exchange for money. Dahmer drugged Conorak, performed oral sex on him, sodomized him, drilled holes in his head, and injected muriatic acid into his brain. Well, at some point, Dahmer ran out of beer, so he needed to go out and get some. He thought that Conorak would be unconscious for hours, so he thought, no rush to get back. Well, Conorak escaped, and he ran naked and bleeding into the street, where 18-year-old cousin Sandra Smith and Nicole Childry called the police. You want the emergency operator 71? Okay, hi, uh, this, uh, I'm on 25th and State, and this is y'all man, he's butt naked, he has been beating us, he's very bruised up. Did he look like a little kid? He had a towel around, and it had blood, and he had blood running down his leg.
police believed that Conorak was 19 and that he was just drunk, and they returned him to Dahmer, who they thought was his boyfriend. Dahmer got him back to his apartment again, and he poured more acid into the boy's brain. But this time, the acid quickly killed the 14-year-old boy. Neighbors continued to complain about the smell coming from apartment 213. And as Dahmer's killing frenzy sped up, he stopped taking care of his personal hygiene, and he was taking less care in disposing of his victims' bodies. In fact, when police visited his apartment following the incident with Conorak, the body of Tony Hughes was still in Dahmer's bedroom. He attempted to clean up his apartment, um, but instead he ended up purchasing a 57-gallon drum of hydrochloric acid to use to dispose of unwanted body parts. After the incident with Conorak, Dahmer decided to start looking for victims in Chicago. And for those of you unfamiliar with that area of the country, um, Chicago is just under a two-hour drive from Milwaukee. On June 30th, 1991, Dahmer met 20-year-old Matt Turner while he was in Chicago for Gay Pride Day. Dahmer talked Turner into returning to Milwaukee with him, where he drugged and strangled him, cut off his head, and put it in a plastic bag in the freezer. Dahmer then put the rest of Turner's body into a barrel of acid. Five days later, on July 5th, 1991, Dahmer took a bus to Chicago again, where he met 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger. Apparently, Dahmer was really attracted to Weinberger. They had consensual sex, and then the unsuspecting man spent the night in Milwaukee with Dahmer. When Weinberger wanted to leave the next day, Dahmer was so infuriated that he drugged Weinberger, sodomized him, and then attempted to zombify him um, by drilling holes in his skull and then pouring in boiling water. When Dahmer realized that Weinberger would not return from the vegetative state that he had induced by injecting boiling water into his skull, he strangled him, put his head in the freezer, and kept his body in the bathtub for a week before he put it into the acid. Cruising his own neighborhood once again, Dahmer met 23-year-old Oliver Lacey on July 15, 1991. Lacey was a bodybuilder, and Dahmer was in awe of the man's beautiful physique. Dahmer drugged him, strangled him, and then he sodomized Lacey's dead body before dismembering him. He put Lacey's head in the refrigerator and his heart into the freezer so he could eat it later. He also kept the victim's skeleton. It was then that Dahmer was fired from his job at the chocolate factory due to habitual tardiness, absences, and poor job performance. The day he was fired, July 19, 1991, Dahmer met 25-year-old father of three, Joseph Brandehoff, and enticed the man back to his apartment. The man engaged in oral sex, and then Dahmer drugged and strangled him. Dahmer kept Brandehoff's body for several days, sleeping with it at night, until the head became so infested with maggots, um, and he cleaned this all up on July 21st. He put all but Brandehoff's head into the vat of acid. On July 22nd, 1991, Dahmer's murderous rampage would come to an end. Dahmer met 32-year-old Tracy Edwards, who was promised $100 to hang out and let Dahmer handcuff him. As soon as Edwards entered Dahmer's place, he saw boxes of muriatic acid and he smelled a foul odor. Dahmer managed to get a handcuff on Edwards and then drag him back into the bedroom. This next clip is kind of long, but I wanted to play to you Edwards' um, testimony at the trial. Then, sir, would you tell us your name? And you spell your last name for us. Tracy Edwards, UDWAR. Mr. Edwards, we're going to ask you to speak up very loudly into the microphone. Uh, I would like to know in what state you reside at the present time. Louisiana. And how old are you, sir? 32. 32? And you are single? Yes. And you were in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on... July the 22nd, 1991? Yes. And at or about that time, on that late afternoon, did you have occasion to see a person that you knew at that time or subsequently learned was a fellow by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes. So you were with a couple of your buddies, were you? That's correct. And what were you doing? Uh, we was drinking beer, just talking, hanging out. You know. About 6 o'clock at night, was it? Yeah, about 6, 6.15. Did you have occasion then to see Mr. Dahmer? Yeah, he approached us eventually and started talking to us. Were you three black males? Yeah, uh, one. One white, two black. So you're a friend? Yeah, my best friend was white. When he came up and started talking to you, what is it that Mr. Dahmer said to you? Uh, he said he was just in the city from Chicago. He was taking care of his sick grandmother, I believe, in West Dallas. 
you have any further conversation with you and your friends? He was just talking. He said he was a professional photographer. He usually pays people for pictures and stuff like that if anybody was interested in making money at that time. Did they have to pose for pictures? Yeah. Did he describe the kind of pictures that you were going to be posing for if you chose to take them up on the offer? Yeah, he said no. No. He went up to the apartment. Tell us what happens when you get up to the apartment. Tell us what you observed, what your senses told you. Okay. First of all, it seemed like a normal apartment. When we got inside, he turned off burger alarms. I asked him why. First, it was a foul odor. Tell us about that. What kind of it was just like an odor. I didn't quite know what it was. You know, he told me a sewer pipe had broke and management would take care of it. Now, you're fully clothed. Yes. Okay. You're sitting on a couch. And he offers, he talks to you about uh, these, this posing you weren't sure you are going to do. Right. How much had you been offered to do the pose? A hundred dollars. Okay. And when he get, brings you the beer, he brings you rum and coke? Yeah, he bring that. Yeah, he brings the beer first, and then he brings the rum and coke. Okay, when you start talking about the fish in the fish tank, you bring that up with the seat. Uh, he does. And what do you do when he does that? You turn, turn to the right, like the fish tank is here. I'm turning all the way over here. You yeah. turn to your right to look at it. The fish tank room. And when that happens, what happens to you? Oh, all of a sudden, the handcuff and the knife is full. Handcuff is placed on your body. Where? Oh, I'm on my left knee. And you see a knife. Yeah, a knife yeah. Now, at that moment, what do you do? First, I feel fear. Then I ask him what's going on. You know, this is not necessary you know, to pull a knife. Are you afraid? Yes. Do you have any reason to know why he did that? None whatsoever. Did you have any idea at that time it was going to happen? No. Did that room have a TV set in? Yes. Was there anything going on on the TV? Yeah, the Exorcist movies was playing at that time. There was an Exorcist movie. Do you know which one of them? But the name, I'm not sure. I think it's three. I'm not sure which one. So there was a movie. Did you know it to be part of television or VCR? Uh, VCR, normally that's not on regular television, so I thought it was VCR. And you knew there was a movie show. Right. Did you see him put it on or was it on? No. When we first got into the apartment, he went through the back to the back bedroom, maybe you put it on bed, I'm not sure. Okay. Then what happened? You're both sitting on the bed? Yes. Are you still in handcuffs? Yes. Is he holding the handcuff? Right. You still have the knife? Right. To point it at your side, as you told us before? Right. You're trying to be cool? Very much so. You're not, a, you're not fighting with him? No. What's your intention? What are you planning on doing? Getting away. I was contemplating on that point, jumping out the window. I was basically talking with this person, trying to let him know I was his friend. As you were sitting there on the bed, when he had you by the handcuff and a knife at your side, at that time, which would have been maybe 7 o'clock, what impression was made upon your mind by the conduct, action, manner, expression, and conversation that you observed of Mr. Donovan? His frame of mind is what you mean. Okay, he acted. At times, he would go through like different changes with me. You know, Tell minute, us about that. One minute, he was like nice. And then he was telling me he didn't want people to leave him or abandon him. Things of this nature. You know? yeah. well, what did you think about him as a person? What impression was made on your mind of this fellow that you're dealing with here? That at times he wasn't himself, and then at times he was sort of like a nice guy. You know? He would come and go different times you know, throughout the whole time. Then he would like sit, being quiet at times, watching the movie, wanting me to watch the movie, you know, and just doing what it's handing sometimes. You know? Did you observe him watching the movie and how he would react to the movie? How he would like to start rocking back and forth, you know, certain parts of the movie. You have to say, what did you say, man? It was like chanting at certain times and rocking back and forth. Tell us about his chanting. What was that all? No, I'm not even sure, sir, but it was just like, I can't tell you the words. I can understand what he was saying at that time. Can you mimic him? How it sounded? It's like a slow slur, like mm, some of that nature, some close like that. I'm not sure. Did it keep on for a period of time? Off and on throughout the ordeal. And how about 
the, the movement back and forth. How how is that being effectuated? Uh, just like back and forth. You would do it every now and then. Just as you are rocking in your chair like this. And chanting. chanting. Was there any parts of the movie that was going on that you saw that he said anything about? It was like the part about the preacher that used to be a preacher that I got possessed. And that, um, and that, uh, it seemed like he was like, interested in that part. That part had his attention more than anything. But tell us about what you mean by that. What impressions were made upon your mind when this was going on as to had his attention? How, would he, how did he appear to you? I appear like, like it was like he wanted to mimic it or be like that part, you know, being demonized or whatever. I'm sorry, I missed Yeah, like he wanted that, that type of movie, that part, certain parts of that part interested me. You know, it was like he changed with me. At times, then he would get more aggressive, try to get me to handcuff myself, both hands. He told me it made him feel more dominant. Okay, did you and he move off of the bed at any time? He told me to lay down face down, put both of my hands behind my back because he got changed again at that point. Like he got more aggressive at that time. Okay, now, but tell us, tell us, uh, did he still have the knife out? Yes, he still had the knife what did you do? I kind of like laid on my sides for some reason. I guess God told me not to lay flat down and let this person handcuff me. So I did. So you were trying to stop that from happening, but you got down on the floor. Right. What did he do? He kind of laid across me, put his head across my chest at that point. What was he doing with his head? Pardon me? What did it appear to you he was doing with his head? What was he trying to do? Like he was listening to my heart. Because at the point he told me he was going to do my heart. Said he was going to eat your heart? So I suggested we sit on the couch and I had him button my shirt to try to make him feel more at ease. And then, and then I just sat on the couch like, and he just started going out of himself again. Going out of himself? He was like paying me no attention at that time. Like he wasn't there? He started the chatting again and just like just sitting there, you know. And then I just, for some reason, I said, well, I need to go to the bathroom again. And he didn't follow me at that point. So I reached up, I got up, and then I got to hit him, and then I ran up. You hit him? Right. Did you have any other belongings there? I had my bag right there at the end of the couch. I was sitting exactly in the same place that I was sitting when I went in there. So when you got up, he let go of your cuff to let you go to the bathroom again? Uh, he didn't even, he just like, just let me stay there. I was going to go for the window. At that point, he didn't even have the cuff. It's like... I wasn't even there anymore. And when you saw that, what did you do? I just seized the opportunity. I said, well, at least I'm going to die trying. I'm not just going to sit here. What did you do, sir? I hit him, and I ran towards the door. And like, he's right there, tried to grab me, get me back in there. And what happened? Then I made it out some. So he wasn't able to bring you back in? He back in there. He tried. He tried. And as you left that apartment, as you got away from him, I'm going to ask you again, what impressions were made on your mind by the conduct of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the actions of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the manner, expressions, and conversations of Jeffrey Dahmer that you observed? Can you give us some words? It's like I told the policeman that this freak, this crazy guy, is trying to hurt me. Did you run out of the building? Yes, I did. Did you summon help? Yes. Milwaukee Police Department? That's correct. Did they come back there with you to the apartment? Right. Did you eventually go back into the apartment with the Milwaukee police officers? Yes. And then he was arrested. Tracy Edwards was one of the few lucky ones who did not fall victim to Dahmer once Dahmer got him back to his place. Edwards escaped, and he flagged down a couple of police officers, hoping they could unlock the handcuffs, but their key didn't fit. So instead, they brought Edwards back to Dahmer's apartment to get the handcuff key. When they went into Dahmer's bedroom to get the key, they saw Polaroid pictures of men in various stages of dismemberment. And these are pretty gruesome pictures. One detective opened the refrigerator and found human heads. 
I've read the 243 page confession that Jeffrey Dahmer gave. Much of it was just the requisite paperwork that was submitted by detectives. On July 23rd, beginning at 1.30 a.m. and continuing to about 7.15 a.m., Dahmer confessed to a number of his murders, 15 of them. Later that day, around 12.45 p.m., Dahmer wanted to speak to the detectives about two more murders he'd forgotten to tell them about. Dahmer's dates and recollections of his crimes seemed to be a bit off. He did, however, seem to enjoy talking with the detectives, evidently unburdening himself. Dahmer seemed to connect with one of the detectives, Detective Kennedy, and he would request to speak to Kennedy um, a number of times over the coming days. Detective Kennedy must have felt that Dahmer was mentally ill and was actually, he was actually one of the few people that saw Dahmer as a human. Um, Kennedy saw him cry, get angry, worry about his grandmother, have normal human emotions. Kennedy spent a whole lot of time with Dahmer, Dahmer over the six week period. I was surprised to learn that Kennedy even brought some decent clothes for Dahmer to wear at his first court appearance, but um, I guess that's just how immersed Kennedy was with Dahmer. There's a movie called The Dahmer Files that is told from the perspective of Detective Kennedy and of Dahmer's former neighbor and friend, Pam Bass. One of the things that Dahmer said after he was caught was, quote, I wonder just how much predestination controls a person's life and just how much control they have over themselves, end quote. Dahmer pled guilty but mentally ill on January 13th, 1992, and his trial began on January 30th, 1992. Although most of us would say that simply by his acts of necrophilia and cannibalism, Dahmer must have been insane. Prior to 1984, if a defendant were to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, it was the prosecution's burden to prove the defendant was sane. And this changed following the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan on March 30th, 1981. Now, as a result of that assassination, the burden of proof is on the defense to show that the defendant is insane. After John Hinckley Jr. was acquitted for his attempted assassination of Reagan, um, he was not guilty by reason of insanity because, um, you know, he, because of the people he shot, right, including the president, the country was outraged that he was sent to a mental health facility instead of prison. And apparently, Hinckley was trying to impress the, the teenage movie star, she was a teenager at the time, Jodie Foster, right? And I you think know, what teenage girl wouldn't be impressed by the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan, right? I mean, unbelievable. Hinckley spent 30 years in a mental health facility, uh, but he was released a few years ago. In something like 1% of all felonies, this plea is used, uh, but only about 25% of those 1% of felonies actually win or are, are deemed uh, not guilty by, by reason of insanity. But prison statistics indicate that 45 to 64% of prison inmates suffer from some mental illness, uh, about 45% in federal, federal prison, 56% in state and 64% in local jails. It's crazy, right? Well, Dahmer was found sane. Um, he was found sane on February 15th, 1992. And on February 17th, 1992, he was given 15 life sentences. While he was in prison, Dahmer finds Jesus, right? Hallelujah. And he is baptized into the Church of God on May 10th, 1994. Jeffrey Dahmer worked as a janitor in the prison, and on November 28, 1994, Dahmer, along with Jesse Anderson, a fellow inmate on the cleaning crew, um, they were murdered by another inmate named Anthony Scarver. And that's the end of Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey's mother, Joyce, she wanted her son's brain study, but ultimately she lost the court battle with her ex-husband, Lionel, who did not want that. So what was it that made Jeffrey Dahmer into the, one of the most infamous serial killers in history? Well, let's start with that old McDonald triad. And like I've said several times, the McDonald triad has been largely debunked as that definitive predictor of violence. Um, the McDonald triad includes bedwetting, fire starting, and animal torture. And that bedwetting is past the age of five. Okay. 
characteristics that are far more likely to help predict um, serial killer psychopathy include things like child abuse. And this could be verbal, physical, or sexual abuse, um, neglect and or isolation of this child. Um, Also, a later tendency towards self-inflicted solitude. So somebody who's sort of a loner um, and prefers, prefers the company of no one. Voyeurism. Um, an inability to feel empathy, animal abuse, pyromania, um, and a predisposition towards addiction, as well as head trauma. So which one of these characteristics did Dahmer exhibit? Well, we know he was um, likely not abused as a child, but there definitely was some neglecting going on because his mother was so uh, mentally unwell that she was not able to provide those things that a child, a growing child really needs. And his father was not home at all ever because he was working constantly. Um, Dahmer was a voyeur and, you know, I'm not sure when it started, but one of the, the best examples of his voyeurism was the jogger that he saw when he was riding the school bus and how he, you know, Jeffrey had run into the woods like, alongside the road where the jogger would run um, and waited for the jogger to come by so that he could grab him. And and luckily for that jogger, you know, he has no idea that he escaped. uh, He escaped what would probably have been, you know, death by Jeffrey Dahmer. Animal abuse for Jeffrey Dahmer, that's sort of a, that's kind of a tricky one because it's not like Dahmer inflicted pain on live animals. However, he had an obsession with the insides of animals. He was not a pyromaniac, although his father was. Um, His father was really into fire. Definitely had a predisposition towards addiction. We see with his mother, his mother, if, you know, the accounts of his mother's drug abuse were true, um, she definitely had some addictive qualities. Head trauma, not, you know, Dahmer didn't necessarily have extreme head trauma, but having surgery and being under local anesthesia when he was so young um, for his double hernia surgery, that could have led to some kind of brain damage. Dahmer was exposed to medications during fetal development, and this is really important. And, you know, in 2019, we know how important it is what you do and what you bring into your body, how important that is in the health of your growing embryo and fetus, right? My son is 19. He just finished his first year of college. He's brilliant, brilliant. And I swear, I mean, you know, I'm okay smart, and his dad's, you know, pretty smart, but my kid is like smart beyond anything that makes sense. And I swear it's because I played classical music to my belly while I was pregnant. But who knows? Um, so, so some of the things that Dahmer was exposed to during his his development in his in utero were thalidomide. Um, thalidomide was used to treat morning sickness, and Joyce had really extreme morning sickness. They stopped using this sometime in the sixties, uh, the mid sixties, because they started linking it to birth defects and brain damage. Joyce also reportedly abused something called Equinel, which is a sedative, it's a sedative that's not supposed to be used during pregnancy, especially during the first trimester. Reportedly, she was given morphine. Morphine can exhibit or can um, lead to long-term neuropsychological consequences associated with dysfunction in intellectual ability and emotional control during that child's childhood. Barbiturates, Joyce was given barbiturates. Barbiturate use during pregnancy has been associated with learning disabilities, decreased IQ, performance deficits, increased incidence of psychosocial maladjustment, and demasculization of the gender identity and sex role behavior in males. I thought this was incredibly interesting because it seemed like seemed like Dahmer had some had some confusion there, and I'm not saying that being a homosexual is a confusion of gender identity, but, but there was definitely some, you know, there's definitely something there, you know, not being attracted to men. That's not a problem. The problem was being attracted to animals and animals guts and dead men and dead men's insides. That's the problem. And then another thing that I found was super, super interesting and that may 
may have a very may have had a very profound effect on him is that barbiturate exposure to a fetus has also been connected to decreased responsiveness to aversive stimuli and appetite stimuli or um yeah ap- like ap- appetitive stimuli so basically it you know you smell something and you don't want to eat it because you don't like the way it smells in somebody a fetus that's been exposed to this kind of barbiturate doesn't get that aversive um, isn't isn't put off by stinky smells so that would explain why maybe uh, he could have bodies rotting in his apartment and have it not bother him I mean if you've ever smelled a dead body and believe me I smelled a lot of them it is not pleasant. Joyce also reportedly suffered from postpartum depression. And infants of mothers with postpartum depression showed the lowest levels of social engagement during interactions with their mothers. They were unable to self-regulate during situations that introduced novelty. They fussed and cried more often. And their physiological stress response showed both higher baseline levels and a more pronounced stress reactivity. So, So basically what that means is that stress levels, just basic stress levels, this these people will have a um, a lower trigger point. So they'll be operating at a higher stress level all the time. Dahmer also experienced a lack of parental bonding following birth. And this is due to Joyce's postpartum depression and the lack of breastfeeding, as well as Lionel's constant absence. So oxytocin pathways are negatively affected by prenatal stress prenatal drug use, and exposure to adversity. When an infant is not receiving or making oxytocin, it causes an increase in that stress hormone cortisol. So that means that uh, a child who has not properly bonded with their parents will um, have a lower trigger point because they're always going to be in a higher state of stress. So did Jeffrey Dahmer suffer from reactive attachment disorder? Well, RAD occurs when an infant does not develop healthy relationships with caregivers, and they exhibit an extreme reluctance to initiate or accept comfort and affection, even from familiar adults, especially when distressed. Some of the signs of this include unexplained withdrawal, fear, sadness, or irritability, sad and listless appearance, not seeking comfort or showing no response when comfort is given, failure to smile, watching others closely but not engaging in social activity, failing to ask for support or assistance, failure to reach out when picked up, no interest in playing peekaboo or other interactive games. Dahmer also underwent that double hernia surgery at age four. And anesthesia, um, the exposure to general anesthesia and sedating drugs for more than three hours in a child so young can cause widespread loss of nerve cells in this developing brain. And it can contribute to ADHD, lower IQ, language development, de- language development delays. And it can also lead to a decreased volume in different lobes of the brain, including the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe we know, remember, talked about this, it's imperative in impulse control and executive functioning. In Brian Masters' book, The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer, Masters postulates that the double hernia operation he underwent at age four changed the course of Dahmer's life. Just as he was beginning to explore his autonomy, that little bit of control was taken away from him. And his want to be in total control without being touched by another man may have rooted itself deep in Dahmer's psyche. At age four, Dahmer began to show signs of Asperger's. Masters also postulates that it was around age six that Jeffrey began to develop schizoid personality disorder, which is not the same as schizophrenia. Um, Schizoid personality disorder is characterized by a lack of interest in social relationships, secretiveness, apathy, detachment, and tendency towards solitary activities. And it is likely that Dahmer suffered from Asperger's disorder. And this is a disorder that would manifest itself around age three or four. So it's probably just coincidence that it started to happen right after, it started to manifest itself right after Jeffrey Dahmer's surgery. According to Silva et al., Dahmer stated, quote, the subtleties of social life were beyond my grasp. When children liked me, I did not know why, nor could I formulate a plan for winning their affection. I simply didn't know how things worked with other people. And try as I might, I couldn't make other people seem less strange and unknowable, end quote. So what relationship or what, what connection is there between Asperger's and violence or sexual psychopathy? Well, according to a 2012 article by Silva and the 2007 article by Struble, Jeffrey Dahmer did, in fact, have Asperger's. 
So there's a lot of conflicting research available that assesses the link or lack of link between Asperger's and violence. I went through a list of U.S. mass shootings from 2007 to 2018, and I was looking for young males, you know, 16 to 25, and found um, out of a lot of mass shootings, and there was a lot of them, that the following accounts of violence in males um, with Asperger's were the fault, were the following. And this is, and like I said, there's, yeah, I, there can't be a link because out of the uh, the hundred I looked at, only five or only four had links that I found. I'm sure there's more. So in 2007, um, I'm not going to even try to pronounce his name, but uh, Cho killed 32 students and faculty at the Virginia Tech campus. In 2012, Adam Lanza walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School and killed 20 grade school children and six adults. In 2014, Elliot Oliver Robertson Roger killed six people near um, the campus of the University of California, Santa Barbara. And then this one hits home because my nephew um, was there that day and was, he's He's alive and he's well now, but he was shot at by this kid. In 2018, Nicholas Cruz walked onto the campus of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and began shooting, and he killed a total of 17 students and staff. So those are four examples of violent males who also had a um, a diagnosis of Asperger's. But there's a whole lot of mass murderers who don't have Asperger's. Following Dahmer's arrest, he underwent um, a number of psychological diagnoses or psychological um, evaluations, and here are his diagnoses. He had borderline personality disorder, and this is a long-term pattern of abnormal behavior characterized by unstable relationships with other people, unstable sense of self, and unstable emotions. There's evidence that individuals with borderline personality disorder have a low-functioning endogenous opioid system, and that alcohol, cocaine, and opioids stimulate the system, and their function is to relieve pain and act in reward and reinforcement behaviors. And so when you have low-functioning and endogenous or like within your body opioid systems, you don't get that, you don't get that feeling of happiness and well-being, and you don't see You don't see the connection between something positive or you don't feel, I should say, feel the connection between something positive and an act that you do, right? He was also diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder. And this is a a pervasive pattern of social and interpersonal deficits marked by acute discomfort with and reduced capacity for close relationships, as well as cognitive perceptual distortions and eccentricities of behavior beginning by early adulthood. And and they'll be present in in a variety of contexts. He was diagnosed with psychotic disorder. And psychotic disorders are severe mental disorders that cause abnormal thinking and perceptions. People with psychoses lose touch with reality. He also was an alcoholic. 68 to 70 percent of patients with bipolar personality, or not bipolar, with borderline personality disorder also have a substance abuse problem. Alcohol has long been associated with violence. And there are some studies that actually report that 72% of men who sought out addiction treatment reported engaging in a violent act. Well, let's talk about Jeffrey Dahmer's paraphilias, of which there are many. He was a hebophile or a pedophile. And a hebophile is somebody who is attracted to the pubescent. And a pedophile is one who is attracted to prepubescent. He would masturbate in public. Um, According to the the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of of Mental um, Disorders, the fifth edition, uh, there's something called the exhibitionist disorder. And exhibitionist disorder is a mental health condition that centers on a need to expose one's genitals to other people. And typically it's strangers that are being caught off guard. And they do this in order, the people who are exhibitionists do this in order to gain some sort of sexual satisfaction. According to a 1988 paper, I know it's kind of old, by uh, Freund and Sito, 54% of rapists admitted to previous exhibitionism. One in 10 incarcerated exhibitionists have com- had contemplated or attempted rape. Exhibitionism is one of several manifestations of disorders of the, the normal male courtship process. Right. So in 
when there's a when there's a uh, a glitch in the development of the courtship process, that whole and the reason why it's called the courtship process because it's courting, right? Think about how birds like there's some bird I can't remember and I hate birds, but there was some there's some kind of bird that. Um, the male will pick up all sorts of colorful ribbons, colorful plastic, and all these things in order to make a beautiful nest for himself. And he does this, well, not for himself, for his lady. He does this in order to attract a mate. So that's a courtship practice, right? And so humans have a different kinds of, you know, we have different kinds of courtship practices. But there are disorders of these normal male courtship practices that, like, it, I mean, it's not funny, but think about if you're a man or if you're a woman and this is done to you and you're just standing somewhere and a man comes up to you, drops his pants and tries to have sex with you right there, right? Like that's not normal. It's not normal, regardless of what you see in pornos. That's not normal. Um, and so these kinds of disorders of the male courtship process can can have catastrophic um, uh, catastrophic effects on the, you know, the, the person. So according to one psychoanalytic theory, exhibitionism is explained by the castration anxiety theory, which I don't know. Um, that would kind of make sense because, I, you know, when Dahmer came out of his double hernia surgery, because, you know, he was four years old. So who thought to explain to him what was going to happen during the surgery, right? He woke up in so much pain that he asked his mother and the doctor if his penis had been removed. So did that give him some sort of, did that, did that set the, the beginnings of this castration anxiety that he had? I, I don't know. Dahmer also exhibited um, zoophilia. And this is when, when an individual is aroused by animals. Um, in his case, they were dead animals. And he would use them as a masturbatory stimulus. I mean, right, there's nothing sexier than a rotting um, squirrel carcass, right? Dahmer was a necrophile. He was a homicidal necrophiliac. And this is categorized in the DSM-5 as recurrent intense sexual interest in corpse, in corpses and can be diagnosed under um, other specific paraphilia disorder, necrophilia. And it gets categorized that way when it causes marked distress or impairment in important areas of functioning. Um, he was possibly a necrosadist, which where he got arousal from mutilating a corpse, which actually kind of makes sense. And and I do not advise that you Google these pictures, but there are some pictures um, that have gotten out onto the internet of some of the things that Jeffrey did to the bodies as he was the bodies of his victims as he was dismembering them, and. <sighs> It's just bizarre, and, and he must have been doing it from arousal. All right, so so how can alcohol play a role in this? Well, alcohol can induce temporal lobe abnormalities, and especially when you start drinking very young. And Dahmer was an alcoholic by the time he got into high school. So alcohol can induce temporal lobe abnormalities, and temporal lobe abnormalities are associated with a number of other paraphilias. Um, there have been studies of pedophiles using MRI to discover uh, discover whether or not they have temporal lobe damage, and many of them do. Necrophilia has been described as a characteristic of an immature and narcissistic ego. We all know Jeffrey Dahmer was a cannibal, and there are many theories that attempt to explain this. Um, Park Dietz, who was a key expert witness in Dahmer's trial, believes that a per person can resort to cannibalism when faced with sudden traumatic stress, such as the case of Dahmer, who murdered his first victim following a breakup of the family. Right. I don't really I mean, I'm not you know, I'm not a, I don't have a doctorate in, in psychology like Park Dietz does, but I don't see a connection between eating somebody and your parents breaking up. Right. A man named Eli Sagan proposed that children who are excessively dependent upon their mothers due to maternal over-nurturing are more likely to express oral aggression and frustration due to separation. Again, you know, I, I would say he was not dependent on his mother at all, but it's an interesting theory. Cannibalism is a, is a natural progression from necrophilia. It's kind of like, um, you know, if you start... If you start doing heroin or cocaine, right? Do a little bit of it and you're super high. 
Yeah. And then as time goes on and you do more and more, you need more and more in order for it to give you the same response. So the idea is that necrophilia becomes no longer as exciting. And so then the, the sicko will start to add more things to it in order to really, um, you know, get himself going. So let's take a minute here and talk about what happens when sex, violence, and compulsion are intertwined. So what happened when Jeffrey Dahmer became sexually aroused during one of his animal dissections? Super easy to imagine since teenage boys can be aroused by just about anything, right? The, I mean, I've never been a teenage boy, but you know, the wind blowing, um, <laughs> their pants, right? who knows, who knows? So you know, you, you can be aroused by anything, the warmth, whatever. Um, and then masturbation itself is tied to reward, right? It stimulates those um, that the reward pleasure uh, neurotransmitters in your brain that make it feel good and it say, oh, you should masturbate again because this feels really good, right? So when masturbation is reward and it gets tied to, it gets tied to something like, I don't know, dissecting animals, that can really become problematic. Because remember that this type of uh, training is called operant conditioning, and it's the use of consequences to modify behavior. You, know, you can think of Pavlov's dogs or that episode of the Big Bang Theory where Sheldon um, was training Penny to not be so annoying by giving her chocolates. According to Anil Agrawal, Quote, masturbation is thought to assume the role of a reinforcer in many paraphilias, end quote. The positive reinforcement of orgasm outweighs the possible punishment. There's also a special form of conditioning that is thought to be involved in the development of sexual attachments called innate releasing mechanisms, which are fine-tuned by imprinting. And to understand imprinting, think about baby ducklings and how they know to follow their mother. Well, what happens if the first image they imprint on is you? Right. And I think there was a I think there was an episode of that the TV show, The Middle. No, it wasn't The Middle. Modern Family, where the baby ducks, um, the dad, Phil, wanted the baby ducks or baby birds. I can't remember what they were to follow him around. But instead, they imprinted on his wife. And yeah, he was very upset by that. But so that can happen. So. So. During a critical point in sexual development, if something goes awry in the innate response mechanisms and or imprinting, a paraphilia can develop and masturbation simply acts as a reinforcer. And if you want to know more about different types of paraphilias, I'm going to recommend a book to you that is fantastic because it goes through a whole lot of different paraphilias. Plus, it is written by one of my um, my dearest and, and longest friends, Jesse Berry. And it's called Perv, the Sexual Deviant in, all, in Us All. And it talks about all sorts of different paraphilias and sort of how they developed. All right, so paraphilias develop when sexual imprinting goes wrong. Did Dahmer's alcoholism play into his crimes? Jeffrey Dahmer would later, in his confession, um, say that he was drunk every time he killed. He also needed to be drunk in order to dismember the victim's bodies. And I can understand that. Cutting apart a human body is, I've only done it when they've been, um, <laughs> that sounds really bad. I've only done it when, uh, yeah, I taught in, uh, I've taught human anatomy and physiology for years and I've dissected, dissected many, many, many bodies. However, they weren't of people I killed and just after I killed them. These were people who donated their bodies to science and their, uh, you know, the, the bodies had been embalmed and stuff. And it could be, it, it could be disturbing. If, you know, if you really stopped and thought about it. Um, so I can see why he would need to be drunk. When Dahmer killed Stephen Toomey, he claims that he was totally blacked out. And you, know, you think about it, the younger that you begin to abuse substances like alcohol, the more difficult it is to overcome and the more damage it does to your brain. You know, I tell my son, I'm a university professor, and I tell my students that, you know, I'm not against alcohol or smoking a little bit of pot or whatever, but you really should wait until you're at least about 25 to experiment too much with that because the frontal lobe of your brain isn't fully development, fully developed. And so the use of alcohol or other substances can impact that development and kind of stunts you in 
that age or that brain space that you were in when you first started to abuse the substance? I doubt we can really ever know what led to Jeffrey Dahmer's depravity, especially since we don't have his brain to study. We can, however, try to unpack all of the the psychological and physiological factors that played a role in his creation. It is unlikely that any one thing is responsible for the monster that Dahmer became. Instead, it was a perfect storm of biological and environmental factors. Dahmer's life was not off to a good start from conception if the stories about his mother's prescription drug use during her pregnancy are, in fact, true. Couple that with Joyce's disinterest in breastfeeding, and I'm not trying to shame people that, you know, women that that choose not to breastfeed. Um, I, I did it for a few months, and it is an incredibly difficult thing to to do and it and it's a big it's a um it's a big sacrifice on the on the mom's part um so i'm not i'm not shaming her for that but i am shaming her for all the other stuff right coupled with you know this this lack of breastfeeding and the likely lack of infant caregiver bonding um the strikes against Dahmer continued to build Exposure to constant fighting between his parents, who, by the way, seem to have each struggled with some degree of mental illness, and his father's perpetual absence at home, Jeffrey Dahmer had little chance of learning how to establish and maintain healthy relationships. Remember, around age four, Dahmer underwent surgery for a double hernia, and this seemed to change the course of his life, at least in in retrospect anyway. Now, also around age four, Dahmer began to exhibit signs of Asperger's disorder, which in 1965 would not have been diagnosed as Asperger's, as Asperger's did not appear in the DSM um, until 1994. Although there have been studies that connect um, AD and violence, this connection has been largely disputed. What is more likely is the impact of AD on Dahmer's ability to make friends, develop close, intimate bonds with other people. Dahmer displayed an interest in animal dissection at an early age. Not a big deal if taken in isolation. But what happens when Dahmer enters puberty? Perhaps he became sexually aroused while dissecting an animal and answered this arousal with masturbation. And then... What if Dahmer's underlying anger at his parents, inability, underlying anger at his parents' inability to get along somehow gets into the mix? Yeah, it reminds me of a of a song by the 1980s punk band The Exploited. The whole song just says over and over sex and violence. Um, is that indica- is that indicative of the typical teenage boy's mind? I think, you know, in a lot of ways it is. So they, so they have to have somebody to help guide them. Uh, to manage these things. Did Jeffrey Dahmer spend time angrily masturbating in his dissection shed? I think he did. And if he did, would that masturbation serve as a type of operant conditioning and imprinting the reward of orgasm outweighing any sense that what he was doing was not normal? Another difficulty for Dahmer was that he was a homosexual, which in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, it was viewed as sexual deviance or as a choice. And this, if you're younger, this you may not be familiar with these things, but it's shocking um, the way the way the world once viewed somebody who was homosexual. For example, in England, being a homosexual was illegal until the nineteen illegal until the nineteen eighties, and in Australia, it was illegal into, until nineteen ninety four. Like I just can't even illegal. It was illegal to be homosexual until until 1994. It doesn't even make sense. So having no one to talk about his sexuality to, it must have been incredibly isolating. You know, I told my son from day one, when he was little growing up, I don't care who he loves. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me at all. Um, And so, you know, you've you've, you've got to allow your children to be who they are. And as a result of his inability to form meaningful friendships and or relationships, his fear of being abandoned and his burgeoning paraphilias, these further isolated him. And then to make matters worse, Dahmer, just as many people who suffer from mental illness, developed a substance abuse problem early. And the accounts vary, but some say that he began drinking before high school. And what role did his alcohol abuse play? Well, first, subjecting a developing adolescent brain to alcohol or other drugs can stunt the brain's normal growth. I remember watching an episode of Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew, who Dr. Drew is... um, just the most amazing and beautiful man that ever walked the face of the earth. 
But he had a um, he had a, a cast member on that was the drummer from Guns N' Roses, and his name is Stephen Adler. And Dr. Drew talked about Adler's serious drug use um, and how he began around age 13. And he explained that Adler's brain was likely psychologically stunted to a maturity level of around 13, right? So that sort of um, drug and alcohol abuse can stunt your brain development. Dahmer reported that he was drunk every time he killed and dismembered a victim. As most of us know, alcohol can seriously drop your inhibitions. Describing his need to kill as a compulsion, it is not a big leap to describe his murderous and paraphilic activities as an addiction of sorts. At first, simply masturbating over his dead victim was enough. But then, to feed his reward system, this had to escalate to necrophilia, and then finally cannibalism. After his capture, Dahmer was diagnosed with a number of mental illnesses, including borderline personality disorder, schizotypal, schizotypal personality disorder, and psychotic disorder. A common component of each of this, these disorders is an inability to develop close interpersonal relationships coupled with abnormal thinking and behavior. So in retrospect, it sure seems like Dahmer encapsulated that perfect storm of biological and psychological abnormalities and dysfunctions to create who he became, the Milwaukee cannibal. Thank you for joining me on my quest to understand evil. If you're enjoying the show, you can follow me on most of your social media platforms at SKB Pod, or you can visit the website at www.skbpod.com for more information about the show. Um, if you are enjoying it, please take a moment, give it a five-star review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Join me next time as I metaphorically dissect the brain of Anthony so well. Okay.